Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa afdhalu salati wa atamu taslimi ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbi ajma'in. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma 'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim. Allahumma anshur alayna rahmatak wa anzil alayna hikmatak. Ya dhal jalal wal ikram. We have reached the 45th hikmah, I'm sorry, 44th hikmah from Ibn Ata'illah's book, Al-Hikam Al-Ata'iyyah, wa nafa'na bi'ulumihi fi al-dawrayn. This is uh, an exemplary book, really a kind of uh, a primer and a guidepost for the spiritual wayfarer. The person who's trying to engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, grow close to him, build a relationship with him, and to really experience the sweetness of Iman, the sweetness of faith. Um, as you know, the last time that we met, we discussed the 43rd Hikmah, which is about keeping good company. And so this one and the previous we are intertwined, because now he's going to explain to us whose company we should not keep. So we're learning about good company and also bad company. And in a way, they're two sides of the same coin. This is on page 30. رُبَّمَا كُنْتَ مُسِيئًا فَأَرَاكَ الْإِحْسَانَ مِنْكَ سُحْبَتُكَ إِلَى مَنْ هُوَ أَسْوَأُ حَالًا مِنْكَ If you do wrong, perhaps you will associate with someone who is worse than you. Then God will allow you to see your own virtue okay there are two possible ways to understand this hikmah because of the way that arabic grammar works so it could be done in two possible ways and then i'll give you the alternate uh, translation so the way uh, dr tariq has translated is rubbama rubbama means maybe perhaps but rubbama it can mean um it can have the aspect of taqlil, in which you are saying that perhaps it might ha it has to do with probability, right? So when you say maybe, perhaps, or it could be, there's an element of chance, which suggests that it doesn't happen very often. Then there's another possibility in which you have rubbama with the meaning of, of tawakkur, that it happens or it could happen, or sometimes it happens. And then it can have the meaning of takthir, right? For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَرُبَّ مُبَلَّغِ فِقْهٍ لَيْسَ بِفَقِيهِ So in many cases, in some cases, perhaps the one that is conveying knowledge himself or herself is not knowledgeable about the information being conveyed. And we've all experienced that. There are people who might convey a hadith but they don't understand the words of hadith and there's still a benefit in that but they are just muballag they are just delivering it they're passing it along but they don't understand the significance of what they're holding so they might have a jewel but un unless if they appreciate it they don't know exactly what they have right so it can mean that or it can with the meaning of takthir that actually that's the way it usually is it usually happens that way so now you're not expressing doubt that maybe or perhaps, but you're saying, well, it's usually the case, or it's usually uh, the situation that kunta musi'an. So then here he's taking it that you were musi'an. So sa'a means to be bad, to be wrong. Kunta musi'an is asa'a, right? Ala wazni afala, to do wrong. To cause wrong, to harm, right? فَأَرَاكَ الْإِحْسَانَ So it showed you الْإِحْسَانَ Right? رَأَى means to see, أَرَاكَ means to show, right? So it showed you goodness or excellence from you, right? Your association with someone worse than you. So this, going back to the way he defined it, if you do wrong, then perhaps you'll associate with someone who is below you, who is worse than you. Then, 
you will fa'araka al-ihsana mink. So then God will allow you to see your own virtue. This is one possibility. But I want to focus on the second possible meaning. Which is that, rubbama kunta musi'an, you might be in a bad state. Then, because of suhbatika, ila man huwa aswa'u halan minka, because you associate with the one who is in a worse state than you, fa'araka al-ihsana minka. So then you start to see and you start to imagine, you start to perceive ihsan, start to see goodness and virtue. Wow, I'm better. I'm pretty good. I'm not bad. Because relative to the ones that you're associating with, you're much better. So you start to give yourself a pat on the back. That, wow, I'm, I'm so great and I'm so wonderful. So these are, two, and both meanings are sound and both meanings are correct. So perhaps you will see your own virtue, right? Which is one possible meaning. But I think the second one is what Ibn Ata'illah intended within the context. No, the, the, the first meaning is sound, right? But this is a kind of self-empowerment message which is inconsistent, in my view, with what Ibn Atta is, is telling us, which is that your empowerment is through connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and detachment from the nafs, detachment from the ego. Because if you perceive your own virtue, that doesn't empower you to be better. In fact, you rest on your laurels and you claim a certain hal that I am in this state, or I am this with Allah. So you start to make claims. And one of the things that we said in this class is we're not going to make any claims. Remember in the beginning, we said we're going to stay away from making claims. We don't worry, is this person a wali? Is that person a wali? Is this person that? Is this person who? We're not worried about any of that. We're worried about how to tread the path. We're not worried, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ don't try to attest to the purity of yourself, right? This is in Surah An-Najm. And before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that He knows everything. That He knows your reality. He knows every intricate detail about you, even in the moments when you were in the wombs of your mother, when you were a fetus, let alone an infant. You were a fetus. You were in darkness inside of darkness, right? So don't think, so the issue is not just that whether, you, whether it's not an issue of accuracy. It's an issue of perception. That do you really have the ability to measure your own purity? It's not a matter of whether you're making false claims or true claims, but do you really know your own purity. So this is this is the danger, and we're going to talk. Up, we're going to focus on the second meaning. But before we get there, let's connect to the last week. Whose company should we keep? This is a simple, a central subject that touches each and every Muslim, if not each and every person on the planet. No one can live in isolation. The human being is a social creature. No matter how introverted you are. No matter how much you enjoy solitude and being alone, no matter how much you enjoy silence, you cannot exist in perpetual silence. You cannot exist in perpetual loneliness and solitude. You must interact with others. And in fact, we learn about ourselves through others. And we learn about others through ourselves. So the idea is that we have to have that suhbah. We have to have that brotherhood and sisterhood. And so there is good company, and good company is going to help you identify your own flaws. They can point it out. They can lead you on the spiritual path. They can also show you the way. That means that by even interacting with them, by spending time with them, then you might realize flaws and character defects within you that you didn't perceive before, that you didn't even notice about yourself. But because you have seen 
that goodness in other people, then you can notice what is missing from within you. But bad company causes the opposite. When you have bad company, فَأَرَاكَ الْإِحْسَانَ minka. So then you start to see your own virtue. And now we enter into a new concept, which is the concept of ujub. Ujub is conceit, vanity. Let's go with vanity. That will be the simplest way of understanding it. Right? It's like, a, like the song from the 60s, right? You're so vain. How does it go? You're so vain, you probably think this song is about you, right? So they're like, wait a minute, <laughs> right? So if you think that everything is happening because of you, it doesn't necessarily mean arrogance. Arrogance is something which is perceivable, right? Something which is measurable. But conceit and ujab is something almost undetectable. We might not even perceive our own vanity. Because it doesn't mean that we're putting anyone down the way that arrogance denotes. But it means that you think that you are deserving of something or that you are at a certain position. So suhba provides benefits even if you're distant from people, right? So it doesn't mean like you're only benefiting when you're actually in their company. Having good suhba and companionship will cover you even in the moments of distance when you're away from them. There are a couple of other aspects. Yes, we're talking about having a sheikh, having a spiritual teacher, someone who's going to hold your hand, who's going to show you the way, someone who will serve as a mentor. That's one aspect. But there's also a secondary aspect, which is the need for having a teacher. The need for having a teacher. Because all of us, وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا we have been given very little knowledge. All the knowledge that we have, as uh, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, you've heard me say it before, knowledge comes in how many spans? If you don't know, just seven, ten, three, right? Three spans. Knowledge comes in three spans. In the beginning, you figure out how much you know. Then in the second span, you figure out how much you don't know. And in the third span, you realize, I actually don't know anything at all. And this is in every field. Isn't that the case? I mean, those who have really delved in deep. I don't know if we have any academic people who've done PhDs, right? But they can attest that when they had their masters, they're like, oh, I know this subject inside out. I did, you know, this honors thesis, you know, or I did all this coursework. Then when you really research a subject to death, then you start then you start to like even the basic principles you start to question right so the same way if you spend like people will argue all the time about tafsir they say this ayah means this and they are convinced inside out but then what about the person who's re reading lisan al arab it's like 30 volumes the, about every word and what does it mean and it's sarf what about the person who studies the balagha of the Qur'an, rhetorical devices? Then, okay, is there a metaphor? Is it a simile? Is it isti'ara? Is it personification? Does this represent that? Does that represent this? Does it have a medical, metaphorical meaning? Do we have to go with zahirul ma'na? Do we have to go with the apparent meaning? Then the person studies grammar and they say, okay, this might be the maf'ul bihi, or it could be maf'ul mutlaq, or it could be a certain direct object, and then the fi'l is mahdhuf, and then the, the then, you st then you're like, oh my God, they're like 10 different, then they look at the ayah, the one person who has a little bit, who's not ignorant, but the person overestimates their understanding, they're like, oh, well, this ayah means this. But the person who's like really deep in knowledge, they can actually craft arguments for the people who disagree with them, right? So they will look at the eye and they'll be like, well, it could mean this, or it could mean this, or it could mean this, or it could mean this. And when we look at the great scholars, isn't that what they do? If we read at tafsir al-Kabir by Ibn, Raz Ibn Razi, for example, if we read Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, right, then what do they say? They give all these possibilities, they say, or rajih. And then in the end they say, but I think this one is correct. 
this is the strongest, this is the most convincing. But people who have little knowledge, they're sure of everything. You can't argue with them because they've already, they figured it all out and then they make a YouTube channel. If you're really ignorant about a subject, make a YouTube channel, right? Because then you monetize it. People who have subtlety and real knowledge don't make a YouTube channel because it's not interesting. Because they're going to talk about, well, it could mean this, could mean... nobody wants to hear that. You can go to the masjid and take a class. People don't want that. They want, they want edutainment. Has anybody heard about edutainment? They don't want education. They don't want entertainment. They want edutainment, right? So it's like you feel like you're learning, but in reality, it's just like, oh, that was really inspirational. If, like, we've accomplished our goal, not if you're like, wow, this is an amazing class. We've accomplished our goal if what we provide on Wednesday lasts you to the next Wednesday. If it gives you an increase in Iman, if it increases your yaqeen, your certain certitude, and your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the moments when you're not in the class, that is the determinant. That is what matters. If you're, I mean, you can go to any lecture and you're like, wow, this is amazing. MashaAllah, my Iman is on a high. But if that high does not continue afterwards, then it's transient. Then it doesn't have any meaning. So a sheikh, a teacher, will provide that. There's a third benefit. That person will serve as your companion on the journey. They will be a peer to you. They will be a support in times that are difficult, in times of grief and hardship. Many of us are going through that. We have a few community members. There's one person uh, within this extended ICSP community, in uh, I think in Bethesda, and lost 21 relatives in Gaza this week, in a single day. We have no concept. We've all, I think everybody here has experienced death and loss, right? All of us to some degree, have some more than others or closer than others. We've all experienced that. I know I have. I have no concept and no imagination of the, what it means to grieve 21 family members at the same time and in the same moment to receive that news. Sheikh Al-Qatanani from, uh, uh, from New Jersey in, uh, I think, Passaic County. He's one of the first imams in America from the early 90s. Anybody that's from New York and New Jersey knows him. He's from Gaza. Last week, he lost 15 family members. You know, I remember him from when I was a kid. You know, he's one of the early imams in, 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 in America. But we have no idea what that means. In moments like that, your iman is shaken. Your patience. What did the Prophet say about patience? When is patient? In the first shaking. Because it's easy. I mean, later on, people are like, well, I'm being patient or be patient, right? And that's very difficult. But at a certain point, yes, we all accept it. Yes, they say the stages, you know, you begin with denial. It's not just, denial is not just a river in Egypt, right? It's... <laughs> no, the, there's still there's still communication in Gaza. The, uh, there's a problem with electricity, but some people have uh, means of um, you know cellular phone. That's how the, the the cellular for the person who is able to get electricity, the cellular service is still is still available, right? So that means that most of the people are not able to take videos. This is another reason that they want to cut the power and the fuel because they want to limit information. Right, uh, so but we don't. But in those moments of grief and hardship, then you need to have somebody with you. Not because they're going to say something magical. I mean, what do you say to somebody who's lost their entire family? Is there a word for that? Is there anything you can say that will reduce their pain? No, but you can be with them. You can be with them, and that's the value of having a good friendship. And wallahi, I have. Uh, you know, I've been imam for twelve years now. And I've had many people going through difficult times, loss, divorce, death in family. 
And I advise him, I say, you know, this is a difficult time. You should lean on your friends, you know, on your family. And it's very sad. So many people say, I don't have any friends. In that moment of difficulty and hardship, or they say, I don't have anyone that I trust. Because people have friends, right, that they hang out with, but they don't have friends. People who they can re deep sharing, right? That level of relationship where they can trust them, that they really have that loyalty on their back. That, but that's, I mean, part of that is the condition of the world, but that's not everybody. There are gems, there are jewels of people in every community. I can see in ICCP that we are blessed, that we have people like that. So you have to go out there and cultivate these relationships, deepen those relationships in a conscious way. When you meet someone that impresses you, invest in that relationship. Otherwise, you're going to end up, years are going to pass and you're going to realize, I don't have those relationships and the ones that I have, I've lost. I haven't invested in them. And the person who lifts you up and compliments you and praises you and says, yeah, you do you, I hope I'm not upsetting anyone, right? You know, who just like rubber stamp, everything you do is awesome. That's not the kind of people you need to surround yourself with because they are just going to serve as an echo chamber even when you're making a mistake. The one who censures you, the one that advises you, the one that encourages the best out of you, that is your real friend. The one who will take a risk of losing you as a friend out of love for you. That is your true friend. And sometimes, you, as we said last time, in Ahsantu fa ahsinuni, Abu Bakr, when he took the Khilafah, he went on the member and he said, In Ahsantu, if I do well, what do we do when our friends do well? We encourage them. Fa ahsinuni. Don't just say, don't just don't I don't need some, I don't need a cheerleader. I need a support. فَأَحْسِنُونِي Then back me up. Help me out. Give me a hand. وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُ And if I commit wrong, if I'm making a mistake, he doesn't say, oh, you know, send me an email or correct me or, you know, tell me privately. No, Abu Bakr, he is a straight shooter. وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُ we said it last week. Then straighten me out. Can you imagine if we had leaders like that in the Ummah now? People can't bear. Forget about a leader of a country. Forget about a Khalifa. People can't even, their ego is so fragile that you can't even correct them. You can't say anything. When you disagree with them, people get all offended. They go, all their feathers are ruffled, you know? Because it hurts their pride, right? <laughs> Especially people who are really successful. People who are really successful are not used to being challenged, right? Uh, and I'm using that word, you know, with a grain of salt. I mean, what does success mean? Allah told us who the successful one. The one that escapes the hellfire and enters into the paradise, that's the successful one. And the one who forgot them own, their own selves. فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ They are al-fasiqoon. They are al-khasiroon. Those are the losers with a capital L. For us, those are the losers. So find goodness in people. And don't be deluded by bad company that makes you feel good, that makes you feel comfortable. Because we are always attracted to situations that are comfortable and we always run away from situations that are uncomfortable. And when we're surrounded by people who say, oh, I, I need to work harder, I need to step it up, we get threatened. We're too fragile for that. And it's not only in matters of spirituality and, and religiosity. Many people in whatever field that they're in, 
They don't want it. They don't have a growth mindset. They have a fixed mindset. So they don't go to seminars in order to learn something. They don't take additional classes. They don't ask for advice. They're opening up a business. Person is opening up a restaurant. Oh, I know. I've been working in a restaurant for 30 years. Yeah, you know about working in a restaurant as a line cook, but you're opening up a restaurant. Why don't you talk to someone who has done it before? No, no, no. I know what I'm doing. You might know what you're doing, but if you seek advice from others, you can do better. And it's that sensitivity to seeking that advice and potentially hearing things that might be discouraging or that might reveal the difficulties involved that we're averse to. Similarly, in the spiritual path, when we surround ourselves with people of tazkiyah, people of tasawwuf, and they start talking about zuhud, about living an ascetic life, life it intimidates us no no this is this is this is too much for us so instead we surround ourselves with other people we want to be the most pious person in the room and we may not realize it but we're doing it perhaps unconsciously right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says man amila salihan fali nafsi wa man asa'a fa alayha right so here whoever does good then it is to your own benefit. Woman asa'afa alayha, so then whatever wrong that you commit, then it's gonna come and bite you. In ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum, wa in asa'tum falaha. I recited this in the Friday khutbah. This is from the second page of Surah Al Isra, Surah Bani Israel. So, Another thing that we want to mention is the idea of ihsan. So he uses the words ihsan, excellence, perfection, goodness, good conduct. And he uses isa'a, asa'a as the opposite. But who is in the worst state? So he's talking about the people who are in the best state and the people in the worst state. So when you're with the people in the worst state, how do you start to perceive yourself? You start to see yourself relative to others, right? So this is like uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, right? You can't pin it down, right? We bring a little bit of uh, physics into this, right? So what's the problem with measuring? So it, when we th we're we're gonna we're gonna make the analogy between particle physics, right, and and the human being, right? What is the problem when we are measuring something in space or measuring something within, within the tangible and the physical world? Like Heisenberg said, you, you can't pin it down because as soon as you've measured it, the thing has shifted. There's an uncertainty in that because you don't have an absolute scale. Everything is relative to something else. So that thing is moving. So can you really pin it down? So the same way when you measure your own nafs, when you start to figure out what is my maqam, what is my status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's going to be relative. And in our case, because we're social creatures, what is it going to be relative to? Relative to others. But the true way of measuring your maqam, your status before Allah is to look at your situations. إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَن تَعْلَمْ مَقَامَكَ If you want to know your stature before Allah, فَانْظُرْ حَيْثُ أَقَامَكَ إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَن تَعْلَمْ مَقَامَكَ فَانْظُرْ حَيْثُ أَقَامَكَ Easy to memorize, right? Then look at where Allah has placed you. If Allah has facilitated the asking of Him, if you are making dua, and you're wondering, is my dua accepted? How do you know your du'a is accepted? Because of the heart feels. But what is an what is a is an indication for sure that Allah is going to accept that du'a? One indication. Allahu Akbar. Jazakallah. Brother Atif, he asabd. He said the fact that you made the prayer 
Because if Allah didn't allow you, if He didn't inspire you with the words and the feeling behind the supplication, you would have never made that dua. So Allah will only inspire His servant to pray if He already plans to accept that dua. The fact that you're making the prayer means Allah wants to accept it. So sometimes we, we perform salah. And this is the balance because we're like, well, my salah is imperfect. So it doesn't deserve to be accepted. But nonetheless, I still believe that Allah will accept it. Why? Because Allah facilitated me praying to Him. He moved the mountains. He changed my schedule. He allowed the highways to pass for me to arrive at the masjid, for everything to happen, for me to have a vehicle and it have, to have fuel inside it. For me not to have an emergency, to be healthy, to have the wealth, the house over my head. He made all of that happen in order for me to perform that salah. I'm not going to be overwhelmed by doubt. I won't be overwhelmed by doubt because the fact that I'm praying is indicative that Allah wants me to pray. I'm looking at our brother Abdullah, right? Uh, at Arthur. So now I'm thinking in an even grander sense, right? that people don't know where life is going to take them. You know, six months ago, a year ago, did you imagine that you'll be here in the masjid? You didn't. So then sometimes we get so caught up with, with self-doubt, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a better plan for us than the plan that we want. And so if you want to know, does Allah love me? Does Allah want good for me? Do I deserve that kind of spirituality, that kind of connection? Because we have a mental block, we have an emotional block. We put up a hijab, we put up a veil, and a barrier between us and Allah when there's no barrier. This is completely foreign. There is no barrier between Allah and His creation. All of these barriers are artificial and synthetic that we have built and erected. Right? So we, so if you want to experience connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you just break the barriers that you made. So you start to wonder like, am I worth it? Then what do you look at? فَانظُرْ حَيْثُ أَقَامَكَ Look at where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you. Now what's the opposite? Bad company, right? So some people they're like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't know, some of our, I don't like to pick on the men. No, I love to pick on the men. <laughs> Right? They're usually the ones causing all the trouble, right? <laughs> so we have some of our young Muslim brothers. They're like, oh, I'm talking to this girl. I'm doing da'wah, right? I'm like, you're doing da'wah with Stephanie. Come on. <laughs> <All right? laughs> you know, is it like, what kind of, I want to know more about this da'wah. Like, tell me more, right? <laughs> That's okay. Stephanie can be Muslim, inshallah. Um, but there's a, there's a deeper problem, right? So people are like, well, I'm going to go do da'wah in the club, right? So I'm going to be Muslim wherever I am, right? But you're putting yourself in a situation which you're not lowering your gaze. There, it, there's a lot of self-assurance. There's a, there's a hubris, if not self-confidence, that will lead to that person's demise. And it happens. Some... Even very strong believers, they're in university, they're in college campuses, they study in uh, abroad and they meet very pious people. And you would think, wow, they meet these amazing people. And some of them, their iman becomes weaker because they're used to being the pious one. They're used to being the one that's very religious. And when you realize that, and when that shakes your iman, then you have to check yourself. That are you following deen, are you following religion, or are you following tadayun? Are you following religiosity? Are you worshipping your own worship? Because true worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no claims. It's based on ubudiyah, on servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to be very cautious and careful about our jum. Abu al-Hasan al-Shadili, he said, Awsani Habibi faqala la tankul qadamayka ila haythu tarju thawab Allah. Wala tajis illa haythu ta'manu ghaliban min ma'asiyatillah. Wala tastahib illa man tasta'inu bihi ala ta'atillah. Wala tastif linafsika illa man tazdadu bihi yaqeenan wa qaleelun ma hum. 
So what he's advising in short is don't even take steps towards someone except that they want the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't sit and spend time with people except that they remove you and empower you against disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't become a close friend to the person except the one that encourages you and makes you firm on obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be with the person that increases you in certitude. Limit your exposure from the people who cause you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why the Sahaba are the Sahaba. People who have knowledge, people that have acceptance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be selective with the friends and the company that you keep. I'm not saying don't have friends that are not Muslim. I'm not saying don't have friends that are on that path, who are not practicing all the time. I'm not saying that. But select people who uplift you, who cause you to be improved because a humble person who's working on themselves might be superior to a person who is impressed with himself or herself, right? So don't be with al-faqir al-jahil, the one who thinks that, oh, I've studied this, I know this. Their jahil is concealed. So akhtaru min al-am al That person is more dangerous than the regular person by a thousand times. This is why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, turab fi wujuhil maddahin. Throw dust at the face of the people who praise you. Is that hadith surprise people? Because we think of praise, we're like, well, that's encouragement. That's positive affirmation. When the Prophet ﷺ is talking about maddahin, what's he, what kind of praise is he talking about? You're not taking, he's not talking about people who say, oh, that's a beautiful painting, or I love your house, I love how you decorate it, or you're so sweet, or thank you for the gift. The Prophet is not talking about that. He is talking about flattery. He is talking about excessive praise with a bad intention. Praise should be in certain situations and it should be with a clean intention. It should not be to you know, dump tons of praise in order to garner a relationship, in order to influence someone. The path of knowledge requires us to keep good company. Surround yourself with people that cause you to aspire, to improve, that bring longing to, 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 of Allah to your heart. إِذَا رُؤُوا ذُكِرُوا اللَّهِ That when you see them, Allah is remembered. That is the litmus test. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the pain of this and the suffering of the entire ummah, especially our brothers and sisters in Gaza. Their situation is very, very dire. And they have no one except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to assist them. And the Prophet said, beware of the dua of the oppressed. Because the prayer of the oppressed and Allah has no hijab. There is no barrier between the dua, da'wat al-mazloom, the one who is oppressed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please join me in hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. نعم المولى ونعم النصير حسبي الله ونعم الوكيل 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 نعم المولى ونعم النصير 
حسبي الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير حسبي الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير الله says in the Quran وهو القاهر فوق عباده that he is the one in authority above all of his servants he is the one in control and the power when we see death and destruction and hardship our iman is shaken because we start to think that material causes are the reason for realities so we have to reaffirm our renew our iman that nothing happens except with allah's permission لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم 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 In times of difficulty when there was an earthquake Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu an he advised all of the sahaba that they should do istighfar and he turned back to Allah so ثُمَّ لَا يَتُوبُونَ وَلَا هُمْ يَذَّكَّرُونَ So times of hardship are the times to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance. أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ مِنْ كُلِّ ذَنْبٍ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ 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 أستغفر الله من كل ذنب وأتوب إليه أستغفر الله تبت إلى الله ونهيت قلبي عما سوى الله أستغفر الله تبت إلى الله ونهيت قلبي عما سوى الله أستغفر الله تبت إلى الله ونهيت قلبي عما سوى الله أستغفر الله تبت إلى الله ونهيت قلبي عما سوى الله أستغفر الله تبت إلى الله ونهيت قلبي عما سوى الله أستغفر الله تبت إلى الله ونهيت قلبي عما سوى الله أستغفر الله تبت إلى الله ونهيت قلبي عما سوى الله أفضل الذكر لا إله إلا الله 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 
لا إله إلا الله حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا 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 الله إلا الله 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 إلا الله لا إله إلا الله 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 لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل و
وسلم وانما وبارك عليه وعلى اهله okay we have a few minutes we can take some questions for discussion see we have a lot of people on zoom we're not ignoring you let let me know if there are any questions comments also this is a little bit cathartic we've been very stressed i don't know between work and the world and family i don't know i can't speak for everybody but i'm like emotionally i'm just i, I, I i'm tapped out so this is good alhamdulillah because the heart and the mind needs to rest a lot of us are you know when we unwind what do we do with our unwinding we break, break up on our phone and then we start looking at we need to know what's happening right but please my request to everybody is do it in the middle of the day don't check your social media especially videos about what's happening in gaza in the evening because there's a kind of trauma from watching these videos we should know but we should be balanced right don't overexpose so there's exposure there's overexposure so if you overexpose then in the end of the evening you have racing thoughts it causes you a lot of anxiety and then you're not able to help if you you know like the prophet sallam said you know that we have to be balanced right so a little bit for this and a little bit for that and then you know bil qasri tablughu it will make us successful inshallah okay that give everybody a chance to think if there are any questions how's everybody feeling we can we can do a little bit of sharing if there are no questions i just said you know honestly i'm overwhelmed you know i hope everybody comes tomorrow to the interfaith uh, prayer for peace i'm i'm going to mention it tomorrow i never knew that peace is so controversial i mean i have been imam you guys know i just mentioned for 12 years i have never never received this number of phone calls and emails i have it has become my full time job just answering people who are mad about an event that didn't even happen yet and they don't know what they're mad about they just know that they're mad both you know from both sides because some within the muslim community they said why are you mentioning that we should release hostages and then from the other side there are others who said why are you calling for a ceasefire they have to defend themselves that's what they say right um but allah knows who is the oppressor who is the aggressor and who is the one who is under occupation for all this time allah knows that and people who know know right but we're hearing it from both sides and the, i give everybody the same response that we stand for the just for justice and for those who are oppressed in this case the people who are oppressed are palestinians right but in the initial phase when when there was aggression done to uh, to jewish people we also we stood and we said we we mentioned about that because our principles as muslims are not compromised we always stand with those who are wrong those who are victim those who are being oppressed and when it is muslim then we have a double obligation we have an obligation to stand with the oppressed those who are wrong and we have an obligation because they are brothers and sisters but even when it is a muslim who is doing wrong we should also stand with the oppressed even zaliman aw mazluma but in this case there's no there's no confusion who is the aggressor and who is uh, being oppressed is is very clear as night and day so we don't have that dilemma alhamdulillah yes but this is obvious to anyone who is knows the issue and this is why uh, those who are hesitant they said well we uh, this word peace what do you mean by peace subhanallah wallahi well i'm not making this up i'm getting weird questions what do you mean by peace i said peace means not fighting do, do i need to next christmas or you know next holiday your whatever your holiday is i'm going to send you a dictionary right <laughs> people are asking what do you mean uh, what, uh, what what do you mean by ceasefire ceasefire means stop fighting well, subhanallah so whenever people are playing with and we have it on both it's not only muslims are not immune for this muslims play with words they say oh what do you mean by no we condemn all terrorism if it's a muslim doing terrorism we condemn it too in this case it's very clear who the aggressor is however there are cases 
in which we have to condemn somebody who is Muslim or somebody who, like uh, in the case of ISIS, they claim to be Muslim. These are Khawarij. So we, we have, uh, but we still have to refute it, even if they are Muslim, because if the aggressor, the oppressor is Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us, Kunu qawwamina bil qisti shuhada walaw ala anfusikum. He said in multiple occasions, especially in Surah Al Ma'idah, that you have to stand for the just. Qawwamina bil qist. That you have to be fair and honest and equitable, and you have to be shuhada. In order to be witnesses for justice, then you cannot allow yourself. Don't allow your allegiance to a certain group. Mean or if you're trying to butter somebody up. This came up with the Black Lives Matter. Or there are a lot of Muslims. They were like, well, we don't want to ruffle any feathers. No, if there's an injustice, we're going to talk about it. We will mention it. We're going to. That doesn't mean that the, the way that we'll conduct it, the way that we'll speak out about it, will be guided by Sharia, by the Quran and the Sunnah. It may not be the way that everybody wants, but to be silent is complicity. So regardless of who's right and who's wrong, or whose side we're on, or who we're going to offend, we should be on the side of justice. This is what our deen teaches us. And sometimes you have some of the pseudo spiritual people. So they said the, the, the people of Tazkiyah. So people, they say, oh, Sufis, for example, are pacifists. This is not true. Who is the greatest hero in Islamic history? Who is the greatest hero? In all of Islamic history, I think we all know, right? In Islamic history, in terms of giving victory to Muslims. Salah al-Din. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi was a Sufi. So, and we, we see that in the, throughout all of Islamic history, right? He was a... He, a and he actually appointed a hafiz of the Quran and a murabbi, a scholar, in each regiment of the army. We don't want ignorant people. When ignorant people are fighting, what do you end up? You end up with ISIS and terrorists. Because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know the Quran in, from the beginning of the Quran to the end of the Quran. They just quote a few uh, verses out of context to justify their political agenda. But people who know the Quran, who know the Sunnah, who understand the religion and our ethics and morality, those are the real people who are murabitun, those who asluha thabit, they have firm roots in the ground and they don't just go with the whims and desires of the day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us hadha thabat, that kind of firmness for justice. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us a tawfiq to influence Amen. and to guide other people, to help our brothers and sisters in Palestine and Amen. give them victory and alleviate all of their suffering and all of their hardship Amen. and give them nasran mu'azzara. Allahumma harrirhum. May Allah save them. Waharrir al-Masjid al-Aqsa ila aid al-Muslimin and save al-Masjid al-Aqsa uh, into the lands of the believers. May Allah Amen. subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings and raise the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi wa sallam